And greetings. Welcome to The Dividing Line. It is a Tuesday at 2 p.m. I believe it is October 20th of 2015. We are back here in Phoenix, Arizona, where uh, the weather is tremendously unsettled at the moment. We just, I was just uh, picking up a sandwich on the way in, and all of a sudden I start hearing dunk, 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 dunk on my car. And it's a hailstorm. Yes, uh, it was. It was great. It didn't last long, thankfully. But we have we have gotten. Is October is that supposed to be a rainy month? Is it? I mean, but uh, apparently El Nino is uh, I, is going to be really. Um, I read busy that, this year. Yeah, I read that El, that the El Nino is bigger than ninety seven to ninety eight, which is the last big one. So, so we're gonna we're gonna have one of those Seattle style winters, apparently. Well, you know what? Uh, been up north enough to know that the uh, the forest could use uh, oh, well, yeah. use all of it. No uh, doubt. No I mean, doubt. Mormon Lake is Mormon puddle. Well, and actually, uh, I was up there in August. Since you mentioned it, and we like to you know do uh, rabbit trails here. Yeah. Uh, and I asked a fellow about that because I'm like, you know, I've never actually seen a lake out there. And he said something happened in the late 1980s, early 1980s, somewhere in there where I guess an aquifer underneath collapsed and the whole lake just went underground. Well, no, I've seen, I've, I've been up there many, many times riding, and I've seen the whole thing filled. Uh, well, you're talking about Lake Mary, I'll bet. Well, Lake Mary and then down to the camp area on Mormon Lake, too. So hmm. I've seen it. I've seen it. But anyway, uh, no question we need, the, we need the rain, as does Southern California. Uh, though I'm not sure that rain can help the stupidity of Sacramento, but that's another issue. <laughs> we are back from South Africa, and uh, it um, ha- we uh, wonderful time. Wonderful. I'm I'm here. I don't think I've ever have I ever sipped tea before. Certainly not on the air. Oh my! Um, I discovered Rebus South African Rebus tea. Rebus means red bush. In uh, probably Afrikaans or one of the many Zulu, I don't know, one of the many, many languages spoken in South <laughs> is, Africa. Is that a bush that's legal in the United uh, States? <laughs> well, I, Amazon thinks it is. That's Woo! all I can say. Uh, and on. Could, could have a whole new meaning to high theology, right? No. <laughs> on <laughs> Tuesday, on Tuesday of last week, well, a week ago, a week ago today, that was the first time I had Rebus, was a week ago today. Now, why would that matter? Because. I needed something to help my voice. Oh my goodness. When you hear the audio of the Monday night debate uh, with Yusuf Ismail in downtown Durban at this echo chamber we ended up in, we didn't know till Sunday. We thought we were going to be in a mosque. We thought we were going to be in the Juma Mosque. We thought it would be well attended. None of those things were true. Um, uh, if you, once you hear the audio, <laughs> I did not even realize how bad my voice was until I tried to actually start speaking with a public speaking voice. I, that man, I'll tell you, I wasn't certain I was going to make it through. I, that was some of the worst laryngitis I've had. And part of it was just simply strain. Um, and part of it was... I've, I haven't even added up how many hours I spent in a plane between flying to Zurich, Kiev, Kiev back to Zurich, to Heathrow, to Phoenix, two weeks later, Phoenix, Heathrow, Heathrow, Joburg, Joburg, Durban, Durban, Joburg, Joburg, Heathrow, Heathrow, Phoenix. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but what happens in those many, 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 many hours uh, in that enclosed cabin is you're with well, through all that, probably what fifteen hundred different people, and uh, that, there's a, there'd be a lot of diseases <laughs> in those fifteen hundred people, and uh, you end up with, and I I've I've gotten really good at I, t- I take a supplement called Epicor that really really helps. Uh, it turbocharges your immune system, and if you get anything, if I get anything anymore, it normally is much minimized and goes a lot faster. <clears throat> but I still got something. You can still hear something in my in my chest. And I- I'm telling you, I was putting the pedal to the metal as far as trying to give me power, give me speech, and just there wasn't much coming out. It was that was that was one of the 
toughest debates I've done just simply on the physical level of trying to speak. It's amazing how much energy it takes to try to speak when you can't speak and when you're trying to debate at the same time. It was, uh, it was something else. Well, Tuesday, I'm at Uncle Dennis's house, and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, Dennis Pillay, uh, his, his son, uh, Adrian, his family have been so kind to Rudolph and I when we come down to Durban. That's where I've stayed the last two times that, uh, well, I've only been down there two times. But, um, and uh, Uncle Dennis is the, the king of cola tonic. Uh, he makes the best cola tonic on the planet. Oh, it's just good stuff. They sent me back. We even stopped and bought me the, the tonic that he uses. And I got it back in one piece, a bottle, a glass bottle. I got it back in one piece. And, um, but I just don't have the skill and, and evidently I don't have the ingredients uh, quite, quite right. I made one yesterday. It was okay, but maybe it's just the location. Maybe it's just Dennis's, Uncle Dennis's smiling face. I don't know. Um, but, uh, anyway, they were saying, well, you need something warm. And I thought, you know what, you know, warm to drink. I never drink warm stuff. Oh, okay. Last winter I got into a little bit of tea for a while, but yeah, we live in Arizona. And most of the time you just, well, you drink coffee, but I, I just never gotten the coffee thing. It's just, nah. I just don't like the taste of it. Anyway, so they say, you need rooibos. Uh, and so they make me some rooibos tea. And uh, I, start, uh, I start putting that down my throat. Oh, it does feel good on a throat. Let me tell you something. It really, really does. Um, and it has the most unique taste. Oh, my. I... I Normally it wouldn't be something I would do, but maybe it was just the context and the fellowship and, you know, all that stuff. But I love it. Good stuff. Good stuff. So when people say, would you like some tea in the future? I'm not going to be so quick to say no. You got any rubles? Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, by the way, while I was down in Durban, before I, I'm going to forget this if I don't mention this. Uh, Wednesday night, we had a great debate in Durban with... Ayub Karim, he's the head of Ikra. And, you know, they did a great job uh, organizing it. And um, Ayub Karim is the, is my Ahmed D. Dot debate partner. Okay. Ayub's a wonderful guy, a little older than I am. Uh, both got grandkids about the same age. And now, because Ayub debates like Ahmed Didot, uses Ahmed Didot's arguments, Ayub doesn't understand what I believe. And so I have to spend a lot of time correcting things. But the reality is that's what you have to do with the vast majority of Muslims. And so uh, he engages in debate in a honest fashion with integrity. And uh, we, had a, we had a great debate on uh, the deity of Christ. And I got to correct all sorts of misapprehensions. I got to respond to the D dot challenge and to just all sorts of stuff. And it was it was a great evening. It, it really was. And the Muslims were very attentive and they listened carefully. And I really, really did appreciate that. It was a good evening. Well, during the break, there were some young guys there from uh, the area. And one of them gave me a CD of his music. Seb Goldswain, and he's a guitarist. I love guitar music. Um, my son, for example, is taking, has been taking for years lessons uh, from just one of the most fantastic guitarists around today. Uh, Jason Truby is his name. And um, I love listening to Truby stuff. And in fact, I, was, I have a Truby playlist in, in iTunes that I was listening to while preparing for the debates and putting the, the uh, keynotes together and stuff like that. So acoustic guitar, great stuff. And so Seb said, well, here's, uh, I, I, I want to give you my, uh, my album here. And he said, uh, you're mentioned in the uh, liner notes. And so I, I didn't open it up standing there in the audience, didn't have time to, but, and I couldn't listen because who puts a CD drive in a computer anymore? Seriously, my MacBook Pro doesn't have a CD drive because it's so thin. I mean, it's a mechanical, you gotta have a little motor in there and you can only make motors so thin evidently. 
So I just now got a chance to burn this because um, these two MacBook Pros still have them. And so now I've got them in my, in my library. Uh, but uh, he, he says, my heroes and role models, he mentions some people. And then the last two he mentions are James White and Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Now, I'm, maybe we're just close in age. <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe there's, these are in the order of age. I'm not sure. Um, for each of your glowing bodies of work, which have received thousands of hours of my attention and focus and have shaped me as a musician and human being in ways I can't possibly begin to understand or thank you enough for. So I thought that was really special. That was really cool. So, hey, uh, Turn up the turn up the volume here. I've got one. Uh, I've got one here. Just uh, just queued up for a second. Uh, we can. It's called meditation. There you go. There's uh, Seb Goldswain. Pictures of a Thousand Words is the uh, is the uh, album there, and he gave that to me during the break in the debate Wednesday night in Durban, South Africa, as we were uh, talking about the arguments that were being made and and so on and so forth. So uh, Seb, there you go. Uh, much appreciate that, and I'm sure that I will. Uh, get to listen to that. I have an uh, acoustic only playlist that will be put in there and maybe put together a Jason Truby Seb Goldswain playlist for future uh, times when I'm working on presentations, so on and so forth. So there you go. Um, I actually want to report on five debates. I did four, spoke a number of times, spoke at Antioch Bible Church, uh, Tim Cantrell and the folks there. I've spoken there every time that I've been in South Africa so far, and uh, they're in the Johannesburg area, and um, always encouraging, always good to be with them, uh, get a chance to preach, and uh, a, a large church for evangelical churches, and I mean sound evangelical churches in South Africa, and so very, uh, very, very good. Um, <laughs> Kofi says, uh, Listen to the Divine Line and Dr. Oakley 1689 start spinning some tunes. One never knows what will happen on the DL. Well, this is true. <laughs> I am a former disc jockey, so... Um, uh, but, but have you ever wondered, Kofi, what spinning a tune meant? I used to spin tunes. I, I mean, I've got a picture someplace of me uh, a senior in high school as a disc jockey. And uh, you can see the 33... RPM vinyl records over there uh, on the turntables, and and that's uh, that's how you played music back then, and uh, so that's what it was to spin a tune, uh, to spin that uh, disc. Anyways, um, so as you know, or main, as I mentioned, let's put it that way, <clears throat> I was pretty concerned about the schedule that we had for South Africa. It's a fairly short trip, but a pretty intense one. Um, because I was arriving Thursday, when did I get in? Thursday morning. And the debate was Friday night. And so, you know, that first day, you can sort of muddle your way through, but it's really the second, third days where nine time zones catches up to you. You know, Anymore, when people, you know, when I fly across the U.S., three hours, pff, big deal. But nine time zones, it's going to catch up with you. The worst, though, is going to Australia. That's 17 the other direction. <laughs> it just leaves you completely befuddled as to what's going on and where you are and everything else. And I was very focused upon the debate with Graham Codrington for a couple of reasons. Um... He's a professional speaker. He is, he's known around the world, uh, speaking in the field of futurism, um, uh, trends and economics, uh, employment, business, so on and so forth. Um, he speaks all over the place. And, and I had spoken with Michael Fallon. Michael has seen him speak. And Michael was like, wow, this is going to be one of the toughest debates we've ever had. So when Michael said that, I'm like, OK, all right. I, I'm not I'm not certainly not uh, going to um, walk into this one thinking this is going to be easy. 
And of course, I had read all of uh, Graham's blog articles, which he had posted, which was very helpful. Um, and he had done a very good job in collating uh, the revisionist arguments in support of homosexuality. And today, that's not easy to do because there are so many. And there are now so many people pushing this movement that they're coming up with new stuff all the time, uh, all of which fundamentally undercuts biblical authority, as we're about to see here in a moment. But um, that's that's the way it works. So I was pretty focused upon upon Graham Codrington had spent most of my time. In fact, I, I, I put together my presentations for um, the two debates at Durban with Yusuf Ismail after that, because I'd totally been focused upon on Graham Codrington. <clears throat> so I was a little concerned. Um, it was very warm. Johannesburg was having a, a heat wave. There's almost very little air conditioning available. And we had the debate at a, at a really nice church. Um, and thankfully, they had air conditioning. And uh, so, because when we first walked in, I was like, oh, this is going to be a really long night. But then I heard somebody say, hey, we need to get the air con on. It's like, oh, whew. good. Um, so it, it was really nice. It was live streamed. So many of you have already gotten to see it, at least uh, the live stream. Uh, Rich said it you, your comment was, you, it seems like you're next door. Uh, oh, yeah. It was like you were right. I was in the same room with you. Yeah. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was good. Um, and fundamentally, you know, I, I have here, this is my uh, notebook that I use for my debates, my live scribe pen, which, <sighs> dummy me, I didn't know that the new live scribe pen, if I don't have it, Bluetooth connected to my iPad, it doesn't record the audio. So I didn't, it, it's not good. We already have the audio of the Codrington debate. We're just waiting for the video, actually. Um, so it doesn't make any difference. And it wouldn't have made any difference even if I had recorded both the Ismail, Yusuf Ismail and uh, Ayub Kareem debates because given the sound quality of where I was sitting, wouldn't have been able to stand, understand anyways. <clears throat> but I'll remember that next time. But I have my notes here, and it is helpful to have them because it certainly reminds me of uh, what was going on and, uh, you know, brings things back to mind. Um, but I mentioned five debates because I did the debate with Graham Codrington. And then one week and one day later, I attended a debate here in Phoenix. I had gotten word of this on Facebook that there was going to be a debate between Daniel Kirk, who teaches at Fuller's Northern California campus, and Dr. Robert Gagnon. Now, of course, Dr. Gagnon is really the leading scholar in this field. Um, all of us are very indebted to him for a lot of the work that he has done. And... Some of you may recall, what, about four months ago, five months ago, something like that. Uh, he was on Unbelievable. And uh, I think I played, did, did I play portions of that? Or did I just mention it? You're not, you're, you're looking at me strangely, so you don't. See, this is at the perfect temperature right now. It's no longer scalding, but it's still nice and warm. It's, uh, it's good stuff. Well, if I didn't, I should have. I, I, I'm sure I at least made reference to the very interesting encounter he had with a lesbian Anglican woman on the Unbelievable Radio broadcast. And uh, it got... <laughs> it got a little heated, uh, shall we say. And I know Justin Brierley pretty well. I haven't been on the program out in how many times. 14, 17, I've lost count. Um, and I can, I can just see, because they were in studio. This wasn't something where somebody was on the phone or something like that. I, I, can, I can just see Justin's face as he's trying to dial, dial down the, <laughs> the temperature in that particular encounter. 
Anyway, um, uh, Dr. Gagnon is a straightforward debater, shall we say. And so, I, you know, it was the next morning right after I landed. I, I knew I wasn't going to be 100% functional, but I decided to show up. Dr. Gagnon wears bow ties. And so I had actually bought him a bow tie uh, to give as a gift. Uh, and I wore my, one of my bow ties. And it was a little scary because I had like seven people just walk up to me out of the blue and knew who I was. And oh, Dr. White, it's great to have you here and so on and so forth. I didn't expect anyone. I thought I'd be a little bit incognito, though maybe the bow tie was not a good idea. Anyway, um, uh, somebody in channel says, uh, yeah, some people, yeah, you did play it. So some people in channel are saying definitely. <coughs> so um, that debate, getting to sit there and be quiet and to know that your position was going to be adequately defended, that was enjoyable. It really was. I mean, um, you know, it, it wasn't close. Uh, Kirk did not present any meaningful arguments that Dr. Gagnon did not thoroughly refute. But what really concerned me was the combination of the two debates. And let me explain why. I, I, this is where you might want to tune in. People like to say they skipped the first 10 minutes, but okay. <clears throat> that was all background for, I think, something that's pretty important. I have said for a long period of time that the quote-unquote gay Christian movement simply cannot maintain even a surface level Christianity. It, it cannot maintain Christian orthodoxy because of its fundamentally compromised view of Scripture. Um, they don't believe in scriptural sufficiency. They can't. The, the forms of argumentation that they use to get around the clear teaching of Scripture will require them to adopt a hermeneutic and a system of theology that is so different than what Christians have always understood Scripture to be that the, the flow that brought us the central doctrines of the faith, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit, the whole concept of atonement and salvation and all of eschatology. And eschatology is much more than the various views of millenniums. Eschatology is heaven and hell and punishment and final justice and all the rest of that kind of stuff. Um, cross, resurrection, everything that's absolutely central to the Christian faith there was a hermeneutical system that gave us those things. But to affirm that God approves of and wants us to approve of homosexuality, the profaning of marriage, all the rest of these things, requires such a radical departure in the interpretation of Scripture that there's no way you can any longer maintain those other doctrines. Now, you may still, you may be schizophrenic. You may be a Matthew Vines that says, I'm, a, I'm an evangelical, or a, or, a, or a Justin Lee, or even a Graham Codrington. But if someone starts pushing you to be consistent, it's a house of cards. It's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse. Because you've gutted it of what the thing that makes Christianity Christianity, and that is, this is a supernatural faith. It's been revealed by God in Scripture. All right? So, it has been my thesis, it has been my assertion. You all have heard it, those of you who've regularly listened. You've heard me say this over and over and over again. But now I have two glowing examples of it. And once the videos are available, because both of them were recorded, I'll probably put together a screen flow to show you. So what do I mean? Well, let's start with Graham. <clears throat> I mentioned before I went to South Africa that in listening to Graham Codrington's discussion, 
of Romans 1, I was blown away. I was blown away. Why? Because his fundamental argument on Romans 1, well, he he backed off on this in the debate. I mean, if you knew what his position was, you could still hear he was saying it, but he knows better. He knows in his heart of hearts that the position he has now taken on Romans 1 is so radical that it's indefensible. It, it can only be of use to the already convinced. And that was the position that fundamentally Romans 1, 18 through 32 is a Greek rhetorical device where Paul is quoting from a Jewish source, and people like to point to the wisdom of Solomon, though there are some actually fundamental differences uh, between the wisdom of Solomon and Paul's understanding, but that may be something we may, we may want to look at. In fact, I would, I would recommend to you if you have a copy of the Apocrypha, that you read the Wisdom of Solomon, especially chapters 11 through 15 or so. And there are some fascinating parallels to what Paul says. There's also some fascinating differences that tend to get glossed over. But anyway, um, the idea is that he is giving the standard Jewish understanding of that day. And then in chapter 2, he says, but who are you? He changes the point of address. And now what he's doing is he's arguing against the Jews and the position that was just enunciated in verses 18 through 32. So the rest of the book is an argument against verses 18 through 32. And he jumps all the way to chapter 14. I mean, talk about skipping massive context changes and everything else i mean it's it's uh, uh it, it just destroys romans just uh, and, and that's why I, like i said the 1994 article calvin porter a couple of people have picked up on that it, it is such a tiny little minority view off in the corner someplace but hey the, the homosexual movement will use anything it doesn't matter um the last thing they're concerned about is maintaining any kind of biblical exegesis so grab anything you can but um, it makes mincemeat out of the book of Romans. You jump to Romans chapter 14, and the whole idea is judge, do not be judging one another. And so it's the, you know, you're trying to get peace between the Jews and the Gentiles in the church, and that's what Romans 1 is all about. Well, that is not the exegesis that led the church to any of its orthodox beliefs. And Graham starts off talking about how he's an evangelical Christian, um, how uh, the Bible is God's final authority. Those are his specific words. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, and yet, once you adopt this type of radical reinterpretation of something as central as I mean, Romans 1, 18.32 is part and parcel of Paul's harmartiology, his doctrine of sin. So, once you dismiss that, what, what are you going to do? I, I mean, you can't put it back together again. And the only reason you've done this is to get around verses 26 and 27. That's the only reason. <laughs> and so, here you have this this willingness, and and by the way, I <laughs> I had an interesting experience. Why is this cooling down so fast? I need I need a more insulated mug for the future because we're we're only we're only halfway through and it's it's really. We'll find out what the microwave does um, after the program's over. That's too good to throw out. Um, <clears throat> I had a very interesting experience. During the break in the debate, Graham comes up to me with a older lady next to him, introduces me to his mom, and he says, I want you to know 
she's firmly on your side. Now that, that was almost as weird as when George Bryson's wife went after him after the debate <laughs> for not having brought this up and that up and all the rest of this kind of stuff. It was like, really? See, Graham is a graduate of the Baptist Union Seminary down there in South Africa. And a lot of people in the conservative churches knew who he was. And so, uh, you know, there are even people in his family that are rooting for the other side on this in this particular debate. So that was a strange experience. But the point is, here's a guy who, though he has a conservative background, has been moving farther and farther and farther away from that conservative background. And the question is, why? Well, the Bible's teaching on sexual ethics and morality is not difficult to discern. But once you buy the idea that the church has been wrong and the church has been uh, mistreating our LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ brothers and sisters, and so you just you grab hold of experience. <clears throat> you meet some people and you meet some lovely people, some kind people who experience same-sex attraction and may even have come to the conclusion that they can act on same-sex attraction. But you know what? They're nice people and I've never met people like that before. And there are many conservatives who have the idea that if you hold to fundamentally aberrant theological beliefs, you must be a weird person in real life. And because a lot of us stay in a shell and don't meet these people, once we do and find out that many of them are real nice people that may even root for the same teams we do or have the same sports interests we do, well, they can't be all that bad. And our priorities get all mixed up because we just really haven't thought these things through. I mean, if Arius and Athanasius, if they had lived in our day and they had had a televised debate, it would have been a wipeout. What do I mean by that? Athanasius evidently was a little, dark, swarthy, unattractive dude. And Arius evidently was a good-looking, tall guy who could sing up a storm, could put words to music, could entertain the audience, could sway people right and left. And so in our day of a visual decision, an emotional decision where we are we are moved by our emotions rather than by our minds which is what makes us humans actually is the, the mind part but anyway um in our day athanasius wouldn't have had a chance wouldn't have had a chance and so when people come out of a conservative background and discover that homosexuals can be really nice people nice in a worldly sense. All of a sudden they start questioning the foundations, especially if they've only taken in and, and understand homosexuality is wrong just by osmosis rather than being convinced of it by the positive teaching of Scripture regarding God's purposes and sexuality and marriage and male and female and so on and so forth. And then that is the ground for understanding the uh, the negative texts in their proper context and seeing it as a as a whole, you know, it's sort of like the same thing with Roman Catholicism. You know, if you're raised the Baptist, you know, the Roman Catholics are just going to hell just because they are, and then you meet a Roman Catholic and they know what they believe, and if you are opposed to Roman Catholicism solely out of tradition and taste and even bigotry, you run into a a, a good Roman Catholic apologist and they can knock you right off your pins because you weren't really convinced uh, for the right reasons.
So I think that's what happened to Graham. And the problem is, once you make the decision that, you know what, I, I've decided that these people are my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, what determines whether someone is your brother or sister in Christ? Your emotions? Your personal feelings? I mean, there is an objective standard that is supposed to determine these things. There is an, there's an objective uh, delineation of what Christian theology is and who is and who is not a brother or sister in Christ. And, and, but a lot of people just don't think about that. They don't allow that to determine their, their priorities and their thought patterns. And so you meet somebody and it's like, well, maybe I've, maybe I've misunderstood these things. Well, no, actually, you've just never really understood why it's important to view the scriptures in the way that, that we do and so on and so forth. But the, the reality is um, you're still not in a good position to be doing biblical exegesis. Because before you were operating on surface level tradition, now you're operating on emotion. Neither one of them is the basis for doing exegesis. Neither one. So, I think that's what's happened here. And what you see is just this, this pendulum swing. And it may be slow, or it may be fast. Depends on the individual. Um, it may start off slow and then accelerate in time. But the reality is there's no stopping point. There, there's no, you know, once you've abandoned the only meaningful means of doing exegesis, a, a high view of scripture and understanding of it as being theonustos, it, it, that's it. You can keep saying you believe it, but you're eventually going to collapse. Now, <clears throat> what does this have to do with the second debate? Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm, and it's starting to get weird for me. I don't know if this happens for everybody. Um, a couple of years ago, I was sitting in uh, Dr. Michael Kruger's office in Charlotte, um, talking with Dr. Kruger and Dr. Anderson, when all of a sudden I realized I was the oldest person in the room. Now he's the president, Dr. Kruger's the president of the seminary. And Dr. Anderson had been one of our channel rats back in the late 90s. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was our Edinburgh channel rat at night, one of our ops. And uh, here I am, I'm the oldest guy in the room. And uh, I just don't feel that old. Uh, I certainly don't act that old. I, I think we both kind of still feel like we're back there in yeah. the 80s and the early 90s. We're in our 20s and we're just still cranking along. Well, not so much 20 as I am a grandfather, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> well, it, it doesn't always correlate. Yeah, expecting, expecting the second here. Uh, Summer wants to, wants to go for October 31st to have a Reformation Day baby. Uh, so, uh, hey, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm, I, I think that would be... I think that'd be great. Anyway, um, just as long... I don't care when the baby comes, as long as she doesn't have to labor for 44 hours again. Okay, that's that's... Summer, we we're all we're all pulling for you on the. <laughs> no more record labors, please, uh, for for all of our sakes. Um, man, that's good. Wow, and you have to. I'm gonna have to make you a cup of this. You might you might actually like it. Anyway, um, Doctor Kirk is not an elderly man. Um, he's not an elderly man. And uh, when, I, when I looked him up, he teaches theology in Fuller NorCal and is a graduate of Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. But then he did his PhD at Duke. Folks, let me tell you something. If you haven't already realized that the big name universities are to their core opposed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about Westminster. I'm talking about Duke. If you haven't realized that these places, that people go, oh, you went to the great school. What makes it great? When, when are we as Christians going to realize that, that 
doing education on a worldly basis leads to worldly Christians. Um, went to Duke. He had the opening statement. And he gets up. And we may be going more than an hour today. I hope you don't mind. Um, though I may have... I'm. Could you wear my tea up? Seriously, it's helping. My, my voice is a little bit on the on the iffy side, and it's no longer doing its nice, hot, warm thingy. Just because so, I'm such a nice guy. Just because you're such a nice guy. I appreciate that. <clears throat> he gets up, and he says, I'm not really going to talk about what the Bible says about homosexuality today. Uh, he says, the fact, Dr. Gagnon and I probably pretty much agree that when the Bible addresses the subject of homosexuality, um, it's universally negative in what it says. Debate over? Well, not quite. Not quite. Um, so what happens? What's his, what's his argument? Fundamentally, here is the argument. And he wandered around, and I guess this was his coming out. I guess this was his big announcement that he is now gay affirming, you know? Um, and um, so the argument fundamentally was this. Gentile inclusion into the church. Gentile inclusion in the church. Um... He points out that the biblical testimony for circumcision is that it's to be an eternal thing. He even brought up Sabbath keeping. Point being that you can make a strong biblical case against Gentile inclusion, and yet the Spirit did a new thing. <coughs> and therefore, his argument is, that in light of the clarity of the fact that our LGBTQ brothers and sisters love God and give clear testimony to that loving of God, then the Spirit is doing a new thing in our day. And therefore, we should follow the lead of the Spirit. <clears throat> Now, Dr. Gagnon uh, pointed out, obviously, he had a whole slide just simply on this, the fundamental differences between the inclusion of the Gentiles in the church and the subject of homosexuality. And he pointed out that obviously the Old Testament had prophesied this, as the New Testament says. I don't think Dr. Kirk would accept that because I discovered that Dr. Kirk's view of Scripture is unbelievably... How do I put it? The, the term is not weak. It is unorthodox. It is unbelieving. That's the only way to put it. And you'll see what I mean in a moment. But... He pointed out that that was a, a bad argument and that there was a fundamental difference. The, the Gentiles were separated from the community of Israel and God had broken down that wall through the work of Jesus Christ to make one church. And it had, always, it had always been his intention to do exactly that. There is no prophetic announcement of some future work of the Spirit where a fundamental moral law based upon God's creative purpose in male and female was somehow going to be overturned in the same way. But it was right toward the end of Dr. Kirk, Professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. Now, everybody got all excited a few weeks ago. I didn't get a chance to, to mention this, and I didn't bring this up, but everybody got all excited a few weeks ago because Fuller denied tenure 
um, to a professor because that professor um, uh, affirms gay marriage. And so they, they denied tenure to him. Uh, let me see if, uh, if I have this in here someplace. Um, yeah, I don't see it here. Cause I'm sure it was after the Kim Davis stuff. Um, no, no, there it is. No, it is him. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. Well, I wondered about this and now I've, I've got a little more information for you. Royal Seminary decided not to offer tenure to a New Testament professor, J.R. Daniel Kirk, whose view of marriage does not comport with Jesus' view. So everybody was all excited about this, and it ends up being the same guy. He didn't mention this during the debate, but same fellow. Um, I went up to Dr. Kirk after the debate to make sure that I had heard him correctly in what he had said. And I'm, I'm just here to tell you right now, it's one thing to deny tenure to a person, but as long as you let them keep teaching your students, I'm not impressed. Okay? I'm not impressed. There are lots of seminaries today that would love to have Dr. Kirk teaching for them. I mean, go to Claremont Graduate School. You can't even get a job at Claremont if you believe in the deity of Christ. So, yeah, there's plenty of, plenty of place to get a job teaching. I went up to him. And I asked him if I had heard him correctly. What he said toward the end of his presentation was this. We need to allow the Spirit to lead us to change our ways of thinking and to even cause us to think in ways that are different than the Apostles and even different than Jesus. And I'm just sitting here going, did, did, I, did, did I just hear this man say that the Spirit of God is leading us so that even though we have the mind of Christ, we should think differently than Christ did? Because he wasn't... He wasn't trying to argue that Jesus held that homosexuality was a good thing, a gift from God. He knows better. So I went up and asked him. And he said, well, yeah. He said Jesus was wrong about a lot of things. He had a lot of mistaken ideas. He was a man like you and I. And then you know what his example was? He said, for example, at least three different times, Jesus said Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Nobody believes that anymore. And in fact, what he says was, even Dr. Gagnon doesn't believe that. So, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. I shouldn't be. I graduated from Fuller. I mean, I know. I, I, I had to read all the books, but I, I guess it's still a good thing that when faced with just rank unbelief, just... And I explained to him, I said, Sir, I, I defend the Trinity and the deity of Christ in debates with Muslims. I just got back from South Africa. Standing in, in, in majority... Muslim contexts defending the faith against the very position you are now enunciating. Your view and the Muslim view of Jesus are... Actually, the Muslims have a higher view, come to think of it. Sadly, now I think about it. I don't believe that the man's Trinitarian. I, I don't believe the man holds... In fact, I... I when I, when I defined Nicene Orthodox, it said that the apostles didn't believe what Nicaea believed. And this is, this, these, these are people teaching in what used to be evangelical seminaries. What used to be evangelical seminaries. 
I mean, I'd be happy to debate Dr. Kirk on this subject. That's not going to happen. I'd be happy to do it. But is it any wonder that he has become affirming? Once you actually believe that the Spirit of God can lead you to think differently than Jesus? I mean, that's a good way around Romans 1 and, and Matthew 19. Spirits led me to think better than that. You know, Paul and Jesus, just products of the first century. Wow. There you go. Now, has Graham Codrington gone that far? No, hasn't. Yet. Yet. But you see, there's always a constant, the constant pressure of the testimony of the scriptures and the word of God against these individuals. They will not stay where they are for long. They can't. And they have no stopping place. It's not a slippery slope. It's a cliff. And so that pressure is always going to be on them. It's always going to be on them. They can't stay there. It's not a neutral position. <clears throat> I should have realized it was probably the same guy. Should have realized it was probably the same guy. Yeah, this is, it, yeah, okay. Now it's all coming together. Let me read you from his own blog. For a couple of my senior Bible colleagues, one had to like the idea that we define Christianity by what we believe. So when I say the synoptic gospel showed Jesus as an idealized human figure, I have not said enough. If I cannot say, and it also shows the divine Jesus as we learn in the creeds, I have articulated a theology that is on a trajectory away from our shared statement of faith. Yeah, you better believe it. You, you better believe it. Synoptic gospel showed Jesus as an idealized human figure. Well, I'm sorry, but Dr. Kirk is not a Christian. Hello? Um, it seems that the Muslims have a higher view of Jesus than Dr. Kirk does. And he's teaching at Fuller Theological Seminary. There you go, folks. There you go. There you go. Any reason why we should be surprised uh, at... Uh, where these folks end up. By the way, you know, as I look through my notes, uh, a lot of people like, one of the things people have liked, and I could do this because since I did do this on, with my Livescribe pen and I've connected Livescribe with Evernote, I could have, um, and, and you know what? I still can. Yeah, yeah, look at this. I, um, I can transfer electronically my, uh, let's see, window, Evernote. You have it? I can, I only did this one page. I, I could do all of it. Um, sure, if you want. Here's, uh, this is what, and I am not selling. I, I do not have a uh, <laughs> a sales license. Careful for Careful that. No, I. Uh, you know, it's a nuclear powered. Uh, no, no, this isn't warm at all. Okay, I can I, I can do more if you want. Well, I mean, it's it's warmer than it was, but it's not hot. So. Okay, all right. Um, the Livescribe Pen, wonderful system. It, it's 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 amazing. Um, I just went into my Livescribe thing shared this with Evernote, and I could do this with all the pages of all my all my debates. And a lot of people did find it interesting a couple times in the past when I've shared on the blog some of the my my note pages and, and said, now, see, here's what here's what I did here, here's what I did there. Yeah, didn't one of them turn into a bidding war once? Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know that. That was the, um, yeah, that was the notebook. Yeah, I found the notebook. I still have it. Someone offered to buy it. Uh, I, think, I think Jeff Durbin offered to buy it, but it was the notebook that I had the day I did the Dave Hunt thing on KPXQ. Oh yes, where he said I don't know anything about the reformers. Right. Yes. Yeah, I've got that at home. Uh, we should we should auction that off actually. Um, but here you can see, and only this is the beginning. You'll notice I put a uh, 
circle next to it. This is this is how when I've written stuff down, and I want to go back and I want and I want to make sure to put this into my uh, response. I, I put that, and then if I want to make sure it's one of the top ones, I'll put a second one in it so it's it's doubled, and then I can't like I said I can't do with a lot of this, but uh, you could actually see on this one if you go back to this. Uh, dee -dee -dee -dee. Ah, let's see. Uh, you can see these circles uh, over along the side. Some of them are doubled circles. Some have numbers next to them. That's when I'm saying, okay, I need to get to this first and this second. Uh, like uh, on here, you know, here's uh, number one. You know, right here. Oh, okay. There's there's number one right there, and there's number four down here. So I was, I'm I'm prioritizing the points for my rebuttal period, basically, um, and. Here in the Graham Codrington uh, debate, in his closing statement, um, he presented seven arguments. And he said, I want you to think about seven, I want to make seven arguments, I want you to think about seven things. And that was the almost the entirety of his closing statement, other than the point where he started to cry and, and said, I, you know, I was asked to keep the emotions out. Um, someone just asked, asked, is that your handwriting? Uh, yeah. Who else's would it be? <laughs> My notebook. Um, it's not handwriting, it's printing. Uh, I've always printed better than I did longhand. Um, and uh, so I wrote down the seven arguments. I had ten, a 10 minute closing statement. And I shocked him. Because I responded, I replied to, all seven arguments in the first five minutes of my closing statement and then gave my closing statement after that. I don't think he was expecting that to happen. Um, but uh, it went well. And I, I think it's going to be a very useful, um, very, very useful debate for people to view. I really do. Um, now, a lot of people said it was sort of one-sided. Well, that's because if you're sticking with biblical exegesis, it better be one-sided. Um, the Bible's really clear on this. Uh, but I think it'll be very useful. Let me skip to the last debate. Um, I've already mentioned it briefly, the debate with Ayub Karim. Once again, I... For those looking for new debates, uncovered ground, not going to be useful to you. For those looking for debates where Ahmed Didat's arguments are aired and thoroughly refuted, this is your debate. And if you're dealing with 99% <coughs> of the Muslim population, that's the debate that's going to be most helpful to you. Um, the reality is that the vast majority of Muslims who listen to Shabir Ali and Yusuf Ismail have no earthly idea what they're talking about. <coughs> None. <coughs> they, they, they don't know what the topics are. They don't know why they're talking about the things they're talking about. They just get excited because that sounds good, but they, they really don't know what, what that is all about. For the vast majority of Muslims, um, they don't understand the Trinity. They don't understand the history. They have fundamental misunderstandings of the most basic things. And what they need to hear is they need the truth presented to them within the context that might actually break through that, that ignorance that is theirs, that is um, promulgated and promoted by their own leadership who themselves are ignorant of these things because... Fundamentally, the author of the Quran was ignorant of these things, too. And so if you want a debate where the good stuff um, is, is right there, you know, the, 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 the good responses, we had, we had solid responses, had time to give solid responses. <clears throat> As I look over the stuff with Ayub, I, I don't think... 
Yeah, th there was... There was maybe one thing that I didn't get to. And that was he spent some time looking at Job 25 through 6 through 7, the Son of Man. That, that may have been the only thing I, I think I got <clears throat> to every single other point that he made. Really did. And the cross examination. Well, it wasn't even cross-examination. The question and answer with a you, really useful. I mean, the questions he asked of me just became wonderful opportunities of proclamation, including Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And I, I, I love when I get asked that question. It's just like time to start preaching um, because it, it's just so great. And then the questions I asked of him Wow, the responses were, well, I, again, debate takes place in cross-examination, and it, it did. It really, really, really did. So I'm very much looking forward to those being made available um, because we never got a chance to debate Ahmed Didat, and so at least to debate a faithful presentation of his position, incredibly valuable. <clears throat> now, some of you saw on, uh, on uh, Facebook, that Tuesday of last week, a week ago today, we hit a milestone. Now again, how you count these things over the years, you know, should we have counted um, the debate where we did two different topics as one debate or two debates? Uh, you know, there, there's stuff like this. But, you know, we, we sort of came up with a with a number um, a couple years ago, and then I've just sort of kept track of it. Uh, there have been a couple times I've gone back over lists and looked at stuff, and you have to make a decision as to whether a... <coughs> uh, you know, Jimmy Aiken and I did a radio debate. There was a moderator, there was a thesis, there was a specific amount of time. Okay, that's a debate. Uh, but... Being on with Jimmy Aiken on the Bible Answer Man is not the same as a debate because there wasn't a moderator, there wasn't a thesis, uh, there wasn't an equal amount of time, you know, all that stuff. But as best we could, uh, as far as we could tell, Tuesday night was my 150th moderated public debate. I didn't get a uh, didn't get the pizza party that's always been promised to me or anything like that, you know. But um, a, little, a little sad about that. They what? It would make me fat. Thanks. Um, but you may have seen on Facebook that a bunch of the guys there in Durban got together, and I threw a bunch of my bow ties in my bag when we went over to Uncle Dennis's house. And you may have seen some pictures that Adrian put up um, of my helping some of the young guys, including Adrian, put on real bow ties. So all of our guys in the audience were wearing bow ties that night. So that was, that was cute. That was, that was neat. And um, I think I got them all back because I was having to lend them out pretty good. And they were my, some of my best ones. I think I got them all back. Anyway. Um, I wish I could say that the debates with Yusuf Ismail are going to be extremely useful and, and, uh, all the rest of that stuff. Now, were they a complete waste of time? No. But the topics were really cool. The potentiality of those debates was very high. But they remain potentiality. They didn't actually end up being what they could have been. And the topics were great. War and peace in the Bible and the Quran. And the Synoptic Gospels and the parallel accounts within the Quran. What do they tell us about the nature of our scriptures? Inspiration. And do we use even scales? We use double standards. 
Now, the first topic, it wasn't that it's unusual. There's been lots of debates on the issue of is is the is Islam a religion of peace or a religion of violence or things like that. Lots of lots of debates on that. And anyone should realize I'm not going to just redo that debate. I want to get to something more foundational and basic. What I wanted to do was to recognize that both of our scriptures have texts that speak of violence. We have the destruction of the Midianites and the passages in 1 Samuel 15 and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and things like that in the Israelite com Israel coming into the land and so on and so forth. And there's even some New Testament texts, you know, Jesus' parable, but bring those who would not have me to rule over them, bring them before me and, and slay them before my eyes. And you go to the book of Revelation and Jesus rules over the nations with a rod of iron and, and in Revelation chapter 19, uh, you know, uh, so on and so forth. So, so you've, got, you've got stuff like that. You've got stuff like that. And so I wanted to honestly recognize the existence of these texts and then ask a fundamental, a fundamental question. How do our texts speak to how we have peace with God and how we should have peace in this world? How do they do that? What's, what's the mechanism? What's the process? And I think one of my greatest um, disappointments is that I actually had hoped that Yusuf Ismail was making progress toward recognizing the need to do these kinds of things. I had listened to his talk, <clears throat> which he had done in 2014, against ISIS. And even though in the past, Yusuf has both debates we've done in the past, and whether it was two date debates or four debates, that depends on how you want to count them. <clears throat> had done the I will use any source that will support my side type argumentation. We had demonstrated beyond all question his misrepresentation of Dan Wallace. I mean, Dan Wallace demonstrated beyond all question his misrepresentation of Dan Wallace. When, when you can get Dan Wallace to do that, I don't think there's any argument, but Yusuf is still trying to argue, argue that one amazingly. But he also does the shotgun thing. You, you, you throw out, you know, 20 different topics that can never be meaningfully addressed in a debate. Just make a bunch of assertions. But my, my hope was that we were making progress toward the necessity of being able to address some topics that no one else is talking about. He's a smart man. He's an attorney. And I think a lot of my disappointment is just that he just has obviously refused to go there. And if anything, got worse, not better in these last two debates. And I expected fully, for example, a discussion of the, the texts in the Bible about violence. It's perfectly logical to do that. <clears throat> what I didn't expect, for example, the first night was for the first five minutes of his presentation to be about Miguel Cervantes. <laughs> yeah. I wonder who suggested that one. Um, uh, yeah, you know, the first night wasn't overly bad until the end. What, what Yusuf likes to do is, what he did was he said, well, Jay Smith said this. Jay Smith said that uh, Western culture has been influenced by Christian values. And so here's what Western culture does. And he starts putting pictures of deformed and dead babies on the screen that have been killed by depleted uranium bombs by the U.S. military. Now, 
you know, it would have been really easy. Really easy for me to have put up all sorts of decapitated heads and people shouting Allahu Akbar, sawing people's heads off, and ISIS having little kids do the same thing. I could have filled my time with stuff to inflame the emotions and numb the mind. But I thought, maybe, possibly, there might be some Muslims on the other side that are sick and tired of the violence and might actually, maybe, want to attend a debate where we actually used our minds rather than flaming emotions. Silly me. Oh, I'll take that back. Maybe there were Muslims there. But their representative decided, nah, let's not go there. Let's do the dead baby pictures thing. But that was nothing compared to the second night. Servetus? Eh, I can handle Servetus. You know, throwing out canards and misrepresentations and ignoring history and all the rest of that stuff. Eh, it's nothing new about that. <clears throat> second night. Tough topic. Tough topic. And I fully expected all of the uh, alleged allegations of contradiction. And he didn't let me down on that. We did the Bible first. I gave a meaningful presentation on how to handle synoptic parallels. I talked about telescoping. I, I And Yusuf didn't even bother to try to engage any of that really he just in his presentation he absolutely if it if they're not photocopies of one another they're contradictory you know just a, a really surface level um thing that, that again shows no interest whatsoever in actually hearing what we're saying uh allowing for the authors to have different audiences and, and, and purposes and none of that. It's just, and of course, from my perspective, he's, he's destroying himself because now we're going to have to look at the Quranic parallels and he's now given us his standard, absolute verbal I I identity, or it's a contradiction. Well, or we're just going to admit that we're going to use different standards. Well, I get up. And I give my discussion of the Quranic parallels. And I go through the parallel texts and and I and it it was this almost all, not it wasn't identical. I had I actually brought in one parallel, one series of parallels that I didn't had not included in my book. But most of it was just from the book, from the chapter where I had talked about these things, and I, I raised the questions. All right, Yusuf has laid down the standard. If you have, um, oh, I can't do this because I didn't save it to uh, Dropbox and I didn't didn't transfer it to this unit. I was going to show you uh, one of the examples. Um, but if you have uh, in Surah seven, and I think it was Surah twenty nine, off the top of my head, Allah quoting Allah in the exact same context. What Allah said at this point in time, and it's different, fundamentally different, fundamentally different, which one's right? And I even said, I recognize that it's not a matter of right and wrong. What I'm asking is from your perspective of inspiration, understanding of, of the heavenly tablet and that there is nothing of man in this and that this is Jibreel, you know, the, the Quran is sent down on Laylat al-Qadr and given to Jibreel and then it's dictated to, to Muhammad. Oh, and by the way, well, wait, wait, okay, wait, hold on. Um, all this stuff I, I present and, I, and it was very fair. 
It was focused. I didn't wander all over the place. I didn't do any shotgunning. I gave multiple examples focused upon the same issue. Here was an opportunity for us to really learn about what each other believes about inspiration and about our texts. Here it is. And he gets out and he's got his 25 minutes. And I have never seen anyone sabotage a debate more purposefully than Yusuf Ismail did in my 150th debate. Never. Never. I mean, he dismissed everything I had said with a wave of my hand, saying, it's irrelevant, pretty much the same words, doesn't matter. Then he faulted me for not dealing with the Quran's use of external sources. He has since said an email, well, you covered that in the chapter, but we never said that that was the topic of the debate. There, I had, I had raised all sorts of possibilities. Zainab bint Jash and... And what Qadr means in Islam versus uh, the New Testament. I raised all sorts of issues. But to fault me for that, it was just, I'm sitting here going, in fact, here's the page. Um, starts right here. I wish, really wish I had transferred this. Um, he, he totally missed the the whole point of my gyrus discussion now i'm not gonna i'm not gonna put it up there I, it, it's too small to see but he, he totally missed the purpose of my gyrus discussion the discussion of the raising of gyrus's daughter and even seemingly doesn't even understand the text because he said that um in one the the young lady had died and in the other she didn't and so the whole purpose of jesus's healing was different I mean, he hadn't even listened. I mean, it's very painfully obvious that unlike me, who examined, when I put those sections, Yusuf, because you said you're going to watch, when I put those sections in my book, did you notice that I commented on the Arabic? I wasn't getting that from somebody else. This wasn't drawn from some website someplace. I checked it out myself in the original languages. And you know you've never done that with Matthew and Mark and Jairus' daughter. You know you haven't. You know it. Um, oh, cool. Uh, note, note bene, Brian Matheson just tweeted me that the uh, Gagnon-Kirk debate is on Vimeo. Vimeo.com. Um, I'm not going to... Yeah, uh, Dr. Gagnon just posted that about four or five, well, probably about ten minutes ago by now, but I didn't want to th Good. get you off the rails, so... Good, excellent. Um, uh, we were talking about it. I have now, now retweeted it. And um, you'll get to see what I saw. <laughs> uh, it, it's up. It's good. Anyway, um, so here in my notes under i have part two parentheses meltdown parentheses close that's what's at that's at the top of the page it says meltdown um what yusuf did i don't know if he was just concerned that maybe i was making some inroads maybe he had gotten some criticism but since a bunch of this stuff was in his slides, this was a purposeful, planned attack. One of the things, he's waving my book around, okay? He's waving my book around. Well, that's interesting. I don't know where... My copy in here went, but it has seemingly disappeared on me here. That's uh, great. I'll have to fix that because that might be something I need to reference once in a while. But uh, he's, he's waving my book on the Quran around, and he actually says, Why not be open about your rejection of the Quran? <laughs> I can laugh now. I couldn't then. 
I could just sit there and look at him like, what? Is someone's confused? So someone, someone thinks I might think that it's actually a revelation from God? <laughs> and then he raised the missionary trilemma. The missionary trilemma. You might say, what on earth is that? Well, he says, the missionaries, and he that's me. That's a Christian who actually seeks to minister the gospel to Muslims. Um, the missionaries say that Muhammad was either mad, possessed, or lying. I demand you tell us where you stand on the missionary trilemma. Yeah, that's directly relevant to parallel accounts in the Quran. Right. Mm -hmm. This is was absolutely transparently an attempt to inflame the emotions of the Muslims in the audience and to completely derail the effort to deal with this issue. That's all it was. You can, you can make excuses. You can try to, but it's, it's transparently the case. It's just all there is to it. He says, let's stop engaging in duplic duplicitous double standards. Uh, Mr. Pot, kettle on line one. I mean, here is someone who is in the middle of doing it. Here is someone who has demanded of Matthew, Mark, and Luke what he won't apply to his own text, can't see it, refuses to see it, won't discuss it, and then, without providing any basis for it, accuses me of engaging in duplicitous double standards. Um, and then talked about, and he says, well, I, I didn't mean this about you. I'm sorry. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. About trying to deceive uninformed Muslims. Deceive uninformed Muslims. That's what I was trying to do. You have an agenda. It's to deceive uninformed Muslims. And then the whole last portion of his presentation. Now he says, oh, this was just incidental. I'm sorry when it is slide after slide in your prepared presentation, it's not incidental. Don't give me that. He presents the Quran codes. Now, I'm not going to do it today because we're almost out of time. But I'll be perfectly honest with you. Shabir Ali's been doing this. Yusuf Ismail is just borrowing it from him. But I can not, I can not work up within myself any capacity to show the slightest respect for the Quran numerological argument. I can't do it. I was consistent. You go back to the very early dividing lines that we have available, and you'll find a number of them where I addressed the Bible code stuff. And I was merciless. Lost some friends over it, too. But I was merciless. I have no respect for using numerology as a means of defending the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Bhagavad Gita, or the Quran. It is ridiculous. I gave an example on Facebook because I, I Googled it while I was in Heathrow. I Googled it. And lo and behold, the very slide that Yusuf put up, I found it. First page of Google. He borrowed it from somebody else. And it was the, the number for mankind is 65. And here are the stages of man's development. And look, they all add up to 65 too. So it's the number of times this word's used in the Quran, say. And it all adds up to 65. Well, not only are there issues as to what forms of words they're using and what forms they're counting, what forms they're not counting, and stuff like that. But 
you you'd have to be a person who is constantly buying stuff on certain cable channels that that promise to make you look 21 again to buy this kind of absurdity Where does the Quran tell you that these are the specific stages of man's development? Well, it doesn't. So, these are made up. They're contrived. And do you really think that if the number of these added up to 68, and there's one that had three in it, you really don't think the person would have just dumped the one with the three in it to make the numbers work out? And what if there's another thing that could be said to be a part of the development of man, but that would give you too many numbers? It's all contrived, people! I, it is so hard for me to maintain myself. Because this, and yet, and here's the sad part. Here's the sad part. We're about out of time. Here's the sad part. He shows this stuff, and what happens in the right-hand side of the audience? Talk me or Allahu Akbar! Talk me or Allahu Akbar! And you just, sometimes you just go, I'm on the other side of the planet doing this? Now I know. Videotaped, people are going to see it. They're going to be Muslims. We're going to look at that and go, no, ah, good. And there are going to be some, they're going to go, oh my. And they're going to be saved. So it's worth doing it. It's worth, we've seen it. We've seen it. And I pray God uses it. But at the same time, you, you just, it, it, it's sad. It's sad. And I said, I, I wrote it down right here. And uh, we had a, two different moderators. A member of parliament moderated the first debate. Um, but Rudolf Bushoff moderated the second debate. And here, right at the top, there are only a few lines written after it. But right at the top of the page, last debate with Yusuf Ismail. He wasn't even done with his 25 minute. And I said, and I showed it to you, to Rudolph. I don't need to travel halfway across the world if the person I'm debating with is going to engage in that kind of behavior. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. Now, I'm not making a, I'm not swearing an oath. I could see some type of situation where I might change my mind. But as far as trying to think that Yusuf will work with me to address and advance, advance the topic, advance the, the dialogue, had your shot. You purposefully sabotaged it. There we go. There we go. So hopefully, especially the discussion of Graham Codrington and Daniel Kirk. Hope you heard that. And I hope it helps you to see. This is a gospel issue. It's a gospel issue. It really is. Pray for those debates as they're made available. And Lord willing, we'll be back on Thursday. Got lots of stuff to catch up on. Thanks for watching. God bless.